Welcome to the Red Chip Poker Podcast, where we share stories and strategies from the game's most fascinating minds. No matter where you are in your poker journey, there's always something new to learn. So let's get right into today's conversation with your host, Robbie Straczynski. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Red Chip Poker Podcast. I'm your host, Robbie Straczynski. And on this week's show, we have the pleasure of speaking with Melanie Wisner. Melanie is someone whose name is familiar to anyone who got into poker during the boom years. Uh, well regarded as a successful heads up and MTT player online, she's made numerous deep runs in prestigious live events worldwide and has amassed over $2 million in winnings. On today's show, we'll learn more about her, talk a little bit about poker strategy, and see what else she keeps busy with when she's not taking opponents' chips at the felt. Melanie, welcome to the show. Hi, nice to be here. <laughs> good to see. Good to be sitting with you. And and. My Red Chip listeners out there, as most of you know, the majority of our episodes, they get recorded via Skype. And naturally, our guests live all over the world and poker players, they're always on the move. So it's not like I'm flying to their houses to meet up with them for interviews. So for that reason, whenever I get to sit with an interviewee in person, it always makes the experience that much more special. Uh, I've conducted in-person interviews for this podcast in locales as far flung as Malta, Sochi and the Bahamas. But this is the first time I've done one right here from my home in Israel. Uh, Melanie, what brings you to the Holy Land? Uh, besides my great love for Israel and Tel Aviv and all the rest, um, I am playing a tournament this evening for the Variety Charity. It is an amazing organization benefit, benefiting underprivileged children in Israel. And they have an amazing event Uh that is actually, I think, one of the biggest charity events in the world for poker. And 100% of the prize pool goes to the charity. That's so amazing. I know it's really special. Uh, so I'm out here for that. And uh, is, this your, is this your first trip to Israel? No, I went on birthright when I was 18. And then what's birthright? Well, I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> birthright is a trip uh, for uh, Jews all around the world to be given the opportunity to visit Israel. Um, and it is subsidized, I believe, by the Israeli government and some individual donors. Mm -hmm. And it's a beautiful experience uh, to be able to come here. And I think it inspires a lot of people to make Aliyah and just have a closer connection with this part of the world and their history and culture. And make and, Aliyah means move to Israel, yes. right? And uh, so I did that program when I was 18 and then I uh, made a lot of friends and have just come back over uh, the subsequent years. And uh, it's just a wonderful place to be. Awesome. And now you get to come back for a poker tournament. That's right. All right. Comes full, full circle. circle. Very cool. <laughs> Well, Israel is just one of the many countries you've visited as part of your poker career over the years. You've had massive success at EPT events in the Czech Republic, France, Italy, Denmark, Spain, Monaco. You won a WPT event in South Africa. You competed at Aussie Millions down under. What are some of your favorite memories on and off the felt from all of your poker travels? My favorite memories, I guess way up there would have to be in, uh, ooh, I want to say maybe like 2010, I was playing the Aussie Millions and I had a prop bet with uh, um, Tony G. He, it was just a free roll for $10,000 that I couldn't learn how to ride a unicycle oh, that's in where on 24 your bike comes hours. From. It, well, <laughs> well, not from that. It, it, it was just like sort of a, a conversation that evolved from that. Okay. And I thought that I could. So I spent the next 24 hours. I went to the circus in, uh, oh uh, in Melbourne and got some training and, and just practiced and borrowed a unicycle, the whole thing. I actually wasn't able to successfully do it. I, I got like sort of halfway down the track that we had planned, uh -huh. but it was a really fun experience. And it was just one of those moments where it was just like, how ridiculous is the poker lifestyle? How did I get here? Wow. Like I'm riding a unicycle in Melbourne and I've just trained to do it for the last 24 hours to try to make $10,000. Like this is insane. That's crazy. But overall poker has afforded me some of the most wonderful travel opportunities ever. And I think um, it is it is so special for for somebody in their 20s to really have the opportunity to travel the world like I like I've been doing um, for the past like decade truly and um, I'm, I'm very thankful to have sort of had that experience at such a developmental stage in my life rather than been sort of settled somewhere been working on a, a more typical career and, and get the opportunity later I feel very privileged to 
to have had my worldview shaped so much by truly the rest of the world. Wow, that's an amazing answer. Yeah. How about uh, on the felt? Any particular memories stick out to you? Should we go with the worst beat of my life? Go for it. <laughs> yeah, sure. It's always fun to rehash those memories, yeah. Uh, one, one moment always sticks with me. I, I was, I was very, very deep in a, in a very prestigious WSOP event. It was a 5k no limit event. And I had, I was chip leader and I got entangled in a hand with the second in chips, who was actually this wonderful old, little old lady. I think her name was Dorothy. She, oh, because of course her name was, Dorothy. I don't, she was like wearing a suit and pearls. And she was one of these people that sort of like. It, uh, so so many crazy things had converged for her to be in this state at the tournament. She was a lovely person. She was not a professional by any means. And I got involved in a hand where um, I had raised preflop. Uh, someone had called and she had also called from the big blind. I had ace king and the flop came ace king nine with two spades or two clubs or something like that. And she had checked, I bet. Uh, the other guy called and she basically made this enormous raise, like almost committing her hundred big blind stack or so. Mm -hmm. And I went all in and she called and she said, I hope you're on the draw. And I said, I'm not on the draw. And she turned over red ace queen and it came queen, queen. Oh. And I remember Ouch. I, at that moment, because as soon as we got the chips in, I was like, oh my God, I'm going to win this tournament. Like this is, I, I had, would have had such an incredibly huge stack with like maybe 21 people left mm -hmm. in this tournament. And I, I was just so thrilled. And it was just such a crazy emotional swing in that moment to feel like I'm going to win this event to how did that just happen to me? What, what is going on? <laughs> after, after an so, entire career in poker, a hand like that will certainly yeah, stick out. Yeah, it sure. was, it was rough. Yeah. Um, and I don't think I was really, I, I mean, I've seen every beat and everything in between, but I don't sure. think I was prepared for something at that stage for such a big equity swing and, and something that I had really wanted for so long, which would have, which would have been a WSOP bracelet, like really seeming like for the first time that it was in my grasp Yep. and uh, just goes to show the, the, the amazing highs and lows that the game gives. Yep. Well, uh, yeah. tournament experience, notwithstanding, would you consider yourself a little bit uh, of a cash game grinder? Uh, that's that's newer to me, and the answer is yes. Um, I think I started playing cash games more around 2014 when I moved from New York to Los Angeles, and I sort of began to find a lot more satisfaction in that than necessarily tournaments because tournaments are are so heavily reliant on your hand holding up at certain spots of the tournament or like one play going right or. And cash, I found that I was able to really uh, capitalize on on my edge and, and my advantage uh, in a more consistent way. Mm -hmm. And that uh, was a lot more satisfying, I think, than than relying on the, the distribution of tournament results to give me that mm -hmm. kind of pleasure and satisfaction. What stakes are you usually playing for these days? My usual game is 510. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes I'll play a different game if it if, if, if the opportunity should arise, I, I think the game on Poker After Dark was 100, 200, but my typical stake is, is 510 with some exceptions. Okay, yeah. and that is at the, the Commerce, the bike, where, where in LA do you play? Um, in Los Angeles, uh, I my main place to play would be the Commerce. I, I did used to play a lot at the bicycle back in the day when I did uh, commentary for Life of the Bike and mm -hmm. things like that. Uh, all the casinos in Los Angeles have sort of been revamped by now. But Hollywood Park the, is pretty nice. Yeah, also. yeah, the commerce has not been. Uh -huh. So despite the <laughs> fact that it is a really wonderful place to play, it is a really wonderful like place to it's not it's not a wonderful place. That's the wrong thing. It, it has great game selection and great opportunity to play a variety of stakes, a variety of, uh, of games. But so it has the best card offerings in Los Angeles, but right. probably the worst atmosphere. I see. And this <laughs> so, is and this yeah. is all Hold'em you've been playing all these years or do you Primarily expand to Hold'em. other, other um, I do play some PLO, uh, but but Hold'em is is sort of my baby. Got it. Sure. <laughs> yeah. As many people in this, yeah. in this industry. I feel like I've known your name forever, and you know, of course, you've been a professional poker player for over 14 years, but give or take, 14 years? Well, I've been playing for 14 years. Oh, okay. I actually turned pro when I was 20. Oh, okay. so that was when I can I can say that I was, I was consistently uh, 
I was relying on poker for my income 100%. Sure. And then sort of never looked back. Okay. Yeah. When so, I was 18 and I started playing, I was I was losing. Oh, so <laughs> most of us are losing. <laughs> Some of us are still losing after 20 years. Hint, hint, me. Um, what is it? Well, still, you've been playing for well over a decade. You know, it's a third of your life. What is it that you love so much about poker that has kept you interested in it besides now not being a losing player? I think, well, I think there's two things. I do think that my love of playing poker has evolved. I think at the beginning, it was more about figuring it out these incredible travel opportunities, the excitement of the tournaments, so on and so on. As as uh, my game and understanding of the world has matured, I think that interest has more turned towards the, the mental challenges and puzzle solving of the game. And with coaching, translating those thought processes and illuminating those thought processes for other people um, have become the more exciting uh, endeavors. But I think when you sit down at a poker table, no matter what stage in your career you're at, it's always a new question, a new way to solve a problem, a new way to uh, to approach uh, various challenges and data being put into the hand. And it's it, no matter how many times you have, no matter how many hands you played, and I've played millions quite literally of hands, mm -hmm. uh, each hand is is different. It's a different challenge, it's a different problem. And I think the newness of that is is always exciting. Awesome, great answer. Yeah. Uh, well, as, as a long time pro, you've obviously had a front row seat watching the average player's skill level improve greatly over the years. Oh, it's not, yeah. the, not the same game it was in the mid 2000s. It's not. Nope. Um, well, besides continuing to play, what sort of study do you do away from the table to sort of stay ahead of the pack? I've always been an avid reader uh, and I talk hands a lot uh, with with particular contemporaries of mine. And I, I think that is the that is the way to always stay sharp and fresh and always have a different perspective uh, looking at your hands. I also learn things from teaching. When I have to articulate my thought process to, to my student, it forces me to be sharp about the way I'm evaluating information and, and apply it to a lot of different skill and uh, processing levels, different minds, access access those mental processes from a variety of levels and stakes and experience and such. So that keeps me very sharp. Um, and I do uh, I do read a different strategy articles and books and things from time to time and I do watch videos, red chip poker. And there's a lot I mean there's a lot of great there's a lot of great learning products and tools out there. Um, I do some work on my own with uh, with like equity calculations and some solver stuff. I'm not as heavily into the solver stuff as as maybe people playing high rollers, but there there are certainly useful applications of it. And I like to play around with uh, heads of displays. I travel a lot, and um, I'm in Canada sometimes playing online, and mm -hmm. so I and I'm very experienced with the use of those heads, and I I really enjoy playing with them to see what sort of data I can get out of them. So right. uh, it it's really kind of like a whole like smorgas like a whole, a whole like smorgasbord of, uh, uh -huh. <laughs> of of stuff that I do. Right. Um, I actually probably could benefit from having more structure to it now mm -hmm. that I'm like talking about it out loud. But I think um, poker has never really felt like work to me. Nice. And, and one of the one of the things that that I think allows it to do that is is to sort of go on whatever information tangent or or exciting prospect that appeals to you in that moment. Uh, so some days I'll, I'll be looking at poker from one angle and some days I'll be looking at it from a completely different angle. Got it. I mean, well, poker... Does that sort of answer your question? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. It's a great answer and it's important. Look, you know, you don't just show up to work every day and say, what do I expect? There's got to be a reason you still like the game. So yeah. that's, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, well, being a professional player for so long and, and a winning player, um, it also sort of, you know, in order to continue being able to do this year after year, you kind of need to have proper bankroll management. Um, everyone has to deal with variance, and I imagine you've seen your fair share over the years. Oh, um, yeah. How have you navigated poker's choppy waters? Um, well, when I started out, not very well is the answer. I, I, was, I was a very, very swingy player. I didn't practice proper bankroll management to start. And I think I didn't care because I thought I was very resourceful. I was like, oh, well, you know, if I go broke, I'll just do this and or I'll just get a stake and I'll be back or whatever. I, I, I was so young that I was very, I think, unrealistic in, mm -hmm. in that way. So it was, both a, it was both a blessing and a curse. Like it allowed me to, to play in this sort of like free, very risky, very 
aggressive style mm -hmm. um, without without being afraid of losing, which hmm. which I think was really important. But it also forced me to kind of learn those lessons the hard way. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I taking shots, going broke, having to build back up, that kind of thing, rather than than being a little bit more structured, metered with it and avoiding that risk of ruin entirely. So I try to take what I learned from my own sort of hard won experience mm -hmm. and make sure that my students don't suffer the same repercussions. But I think for me, I was, I was a kid, um, that always wanted to have the experience of mm -hmm. knowing something. So if someone had told me and, and there were people that told me and articles and available, even in, in my time, like this is the, this is why bankroll management is important. These are the amount of buy-ins you have to have. This is why you shouldn't put more than 1% of your bankroll in an internment. Like I would probably read that and be like, eh, does that really apply to me? And then I had to learn it that way. So I think I would have always needed that experience to know what that really felt like. Right. Um, and I think, I think getting getting older uh, maturing in the game uh edges being diminished with the average skill level of a player going up i think um figuring out how to make the income of poker more consistent rather than having to having to sort of let your mentality and emotions go along with whatever swings are happening in the game mm -hmm. is very important for sanity and i think getting older has a uh, has made me sort of crave stability in that way. So it's it's naturally kind of evened out for me. Mm -hmm. Poker, like gravitation towards cash games, uh, being being more practical with the way I structure my tournament buy-ins, mm -hmm. my, uh, my shot taking, that kind of thing. Um, so I think that's naturally evened out over time with experience and and not not being so risk tolerant anymore. Right. I think that's kind of like the natural, the natural I've had enough approach. of going broke for this decade. Right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and it just like, it doesn't feel good to, to, to have that happen. It, it feels much better to, to, to have a little bit more structure for yourself and, and have consistent wins and, and be able to, 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 to have more control over the way sure. poker goes because there's a lot of elements in poker that are out of your control already. Yep. So what you can have control over, um, you should. And it, it becomes very rewarding to, to do that. Sure, and it's one thing, I mean, like in a sense, that's kind of a by the book answer, but it's one thing to read it. It's another yeah. thing to experience it and <laughs> yeah. know it. And it's a uh, it much more hard won lesson. And also hearing it from a successful pro who's and maybe you know, I been didn't, through. Maybe yeah. I didn't need that. You know, maybe I didn't oh. need to, maybe I didn't need to suffer that. Like my <laughs> my boyfriend would, would say like, he learns from the mistakes of others. So if, if he were to play poker, which which he doesn't, but if he, if he were to, I highly doubt he would ever go broke. He would ever like bust his bankroll because mm -hmm. he would get it. And for me, I'd be like, well, I, I don't know. Like maybe this doesn't apply to me. Let me, let me, <laughs> let me test this out for myself. Sure. So I always learned through, through experience for both, both the good and the bad. Mm -hmm. And that was one thing that, you know, when I was 19 playing poker, I, I sort of was just willing to, to see what happened. Right. <laughs> and now I know what happens. Yep. So. Yep. <laughs> And you can live to tell the tale. And I can live to tell the tale. Yeah. Um, you've mentioned coaching and, and your students uh, a few times now. Obviously, you know, you've been a coach for a little over seven years. Um, seems like there's a lot of coaches out there today. What skills do you focus on in particular with your students? And what would you say makes your coaching style unique? Good question. Uh, there are a lot of coaches and there's a lot of learning material out there. And sometimes navigating all that learning material can be very difficult. Uh, sort of separating the wheat from the chaff uh, is, is a skill on its own. I have always felt that I, my, one, of my, one of my biggest gifts in poker is being able to understand someone else's thought process and mindset and having been self-taught and sort of gone through those lessons like I was just saying, um, I can access those thought processes at every point because I, I went through them. I was them. Mm. I know how these players thought, what was wrong with them, how I learned, what was the turning point to get to the next level, all mm. of that stuff. So that that has helped me greatly. And I think being be, having the sort of artistic background I have allows me to be uh, somewhat empathetic to that emotional and psychological process. And not only be empathetic, but have the communicative tools to access the thought process and explain it and teach it 
in a way that will resonate with them, which is a which is a very unique thing to every person. So you can be the smartest person in the world and the best player in the world and have the best results, but there's a reason why there's a reason aside from the fact that they're raking in millions of dollars that the that all of the super high rollers don't teach because some people can't they they run into a hurdle at one of those aspects of of teaching, communicating the thought process, understanding the student, uh, being able to reach a, a variety of mindsets, that kind of thing. Um, and so it, it's kind of a it, it's 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 being duly skilled in those ways. Mm -hmm. So I think I think that is a is is a skill of mine. And I know that um, having having a, some some experience with with a lesson here or there or a teaching tool here or there from from other people, um, some have resonated more than others. And I've always felt it's not just the 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 way that someone thinks or they play that that is that is necessarily interesting or useful but the way that can translate to how i think how i play how i respond uh so so that that communication thing has always been very important to me and it's something that i that i feel i am gifted at in reaching a, a variety of of mindsets i also work a lot uh with mental game with mental game mm -hmm. Uh, which is which is really crucial to high level success in poker. And I had a student tell me the other day, oh, I bet I bet you didn't think that uh, when you signed up to be my poker coach, you were going to be my psychologist as well. And I said, actually, I did think that I planned on doing that. That is half of poker. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of people suffer from the inability to execute in game. So, you know, we go over theory or they read books or they watch whatever and they get it. You know, it's they understand why it works. It makes sense. It's logic. It's math. It's it, it, it all makes sense and they get it. But when it comes down to executing in game, there's something there's something there. And no matter how much you study, no matter how much you learn, no matter how much I tell you the right process and you agree with the analysis of it, um, if you can't execute in game, that is that is a completely different problem. And a lot of a lot of people when teaching focus a lot on the strategy and less on some of the inefficiencies from strategy to execution, which mm -hmm. I feel is really important. You know, you can be the best poker player in the world, but theoretically, but if you only can play B game or C game when right. actually at the table, it it it's all for naught. Right. So we work we work a lot on that. I, I like to I like to take hands in situations where people have failed mm -hmm. and try to glean as much as I can from them. Um, I like for a, a lot of people when they're presented with failure or a hand that they made a mistake in, they try to move it away from their mind. They try to distance themselves from it, just make sure they don't do the same strategic thing. I like to access it, use it, remember what you were thinking in that moment. Remember how it felt. Really try to get close to that feeling and identify it. And then the next time you feel it, you will recognize it and be able to do something different. That that kind of thing. That's just like one sort of little element I play with. But the mental game is really important. And um, when you're playing a game of incomplete information, it's very easy to doubt yourself, very easy to lose confidence, very easy to, to seek validation or to make a call to, to have information finally. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a constant it's a constant battle. And it's, and it's something that requires a lot of work and a lot of honesty. It's a phenomenal answer. And I've got to say, sorry. No, it's, long <laughs> it's, it's, it's an amazing answer. And I've got to say, you're talking about like, you know, the ability to communicate well and effectively. That's something I've mentioned at the outset. You know, when you're sitting in front of someone, you notice things that you don't necessarily notice through Skype. And folks, I've had plenty of time to prepare these questions, but Melanie has, you know, a split second to prepare her answer and uh, knocking you know, it out of the park <laughs> using those $5 SAT words. Also, I really love it. It's wonderful. Um, you alluded to this before, Melanie, uh, about not just being a teacher, but also learning from being a teacher. Um, what are some of the lessons you've learned as a poker coach and how has that made you a better player? Man, that is a really good question. When I think about it, I think about it in terms of theory. So, you know, my, my students will ask a question, well, why did you do this? Or why is this important? Or, or what about this element? And it's easy to get into like a very, uh, formulaic way of processing information um, especially when you've been doing the same thing for millions of hands you you expect to be able to process all the variables efficiently and you expect to be good at it and sometimes it's kind of like cleaning a house uh, eventually you go like through the motions sometimes and you completely forget you've forgotten to dust off the top of the lamp for like the last year guilty, and, <laughs> guilty. <laughs> and so when my students ask me questions about specific elements of my thought process or strategy or why I would do something that forces me to look at it um, 
in a in a sort of fresh way from a, a more novice perspective, sometimes I realize, oh, I haven't been considering those elements as much as I thought, or I'll be playing the next day and I'll remember something my student has, has had said about why they made an error and I'll I'll find myself acknowledging that that same error or fixing that error or whatever the next day. So it 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 it, it kind of like sheds a little bit of light on each decision point and why they're all important and things that I've maybe um, automated mm -hmm. over the years right. and and kind of kind of just dust off and look at in a in a fresh way. I think that's the that's the main that's the main thing. Um, I think I think that's the that's the main thing. Uh, and the struggle, but but another thing is that the struggles uh, my students discuss, like psychologically, uh, confidence, that kind of thing, it always reminds me that your opponents are just as nervous as you are um there this idea that everyone is confident that everyone has all the answers is is just not true and it gives me a window into all the into all the the people that are my opponents essentially can be can be my students and and it's very useful to hear the different thought processes even if something is wrong even if my st students are thinking something that is completely wrong doesn't make sense not logical people are thinking this way and it's important to know that they are and when you're a professional sometimes you get caught um you get caught up into assigning people thought processes that are too similar to your own, giving them too much credit, assuming they will think logically. And sometimes hearing someone struggle through uh, decision-making or, or something making sense in the hand is useful to know that not everyone is on the same page as you, not everyone thinks logically, and it's important to, to allow for that variability when um, interpreting a hand and analyzing a hand and evaluating a hand. Sure. So those are a couple of things, yeah. I guess, on, on the spot. Yeah, that I can. Well, <laughs> certainly demonstrating that you're always learning. And, and I know I feel, you know, this conversation so far that I'm definitely learning. Uh, when we come back, we're going to learn a little bit more about Bellany's life and career, as well as what other pursuits she's got away from the poker tables. But first, a little strategy break. So as a general rule in poker, the deeper the stacks, the more aggressively we're supposed to bluff on the earlier streets. This is related to a poker concept known as leverage. So how does it work? The term leverage carries the implication that we're making use of chips that we haven't directly placed into the pot. It's best illustrated with a quick example. Imagine, for example, that we are playing with relatively short stacks, perhaps 20 or 30 big blind effective. We have top pair, and our opponent wants to get all in on the turn. He makes a somewhat large turn bet, but we run a pot odds calculation, and we figure out that we have enough equity to make the call. Now imagine the exact same situation, the same large bet on the turn, but this time we're playing 200 big blind effective. A common mistake here is to assume that the turn mass is the same. After all, we have the same equity and our opponent's bet sizing is the same, so we can look to call with the same range of hands, right? So this is where the idea of leverage comes in. We are significantly less comfortable about making the turn call when the stacks are deep. The problem is simply that Villain has the opportunity to follow up with another large bet on the river and potentially force us off our holding. The effective price we are getting on the turn is hence actually much worse, since we aren't guaranteed to fully realize our equity when calling the turn bet. Villain might never even go on to bet those chips on the river, but the fact that it is a possibility affects the profitability of our turn decisions. So this is one reason why it is theoretically correct to bluff more aggressively as the stacks get deeper. The threat of future action makes it harder and harder for our opponent to profitably call. Welcome back, everyone, to the Red Chip Poker Podcast. Robbie Straczynski sitting here in Tel Aviv with professional poker player and life boss, Melanie Wisner. <laughs> Melanie, you basically became a poker pro right out of the gates, but you did also go to college. You earned a degree in musical theater from NYU. When you first enrolled, did you have dreams of pursuing a career that would land you on Broadway? I did. Um, I was involved in arts my whole adolescent life, and it was my dream to go to NYU and combine music, dance, and theater, and do musical theater. And um, I was that—that that was what I wanted to do. That was what I was doing. And poker just sort of 
came in. Uh, it was it was meant originally to be as a, a vehicle for my auditioning. So I thought Ooh. I would play poker. I would be able to make my own schedule. I wouldn't have to wait tables, uh, which I had done since I was 16, actually. Um, and it, it seemed perfect for that. But but it's sort of like like anything else that that overtakes you. You know, I was eating, sleeping, breathing poker and everything else just sort of fell to the side. So it was meant to be a vehicle to support this, but I, it became all that I was doing. So I guess I ended up loving it more than what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, everything else just sort of like fell to the side and I, I just kind of ran with it. What do you love about the performing arts? I really love the ability to convey emotion to other people. And um, as I'm sure you know, having done your research on me, uh, I'm part owner. I've, I'm part owner of a small theater company and do directing. And uh, I I love being able to translate an experience to an audience. I I know what the what I what I want them to feel, mm. and I know how to get that out of my actors and, and that kind of thing. So I think I I love being able to transmit a very specific idea emotionally to someone else and have them feel it hmm. and that that's very special to me that's a very very unique answer um do you see live poker as sort of having to perform even for just a small audience you know a little bit um and especially earlier in my career i had a lot of stage fright i guess you could say um being on tv and like being deep in tournaments like there are definitely tournaments in my in my early career where uh, you know, nothing re really went wrong. It wasn't like I suffered some terrible bad beat or whatever, but I had a shot and I just kind of froze up uh, mm. when it was like deep and I just, I, I got scared and, and wasn't able to really play my game and, and things like that. So it, it, it is, uh, it is a bit of a performance and it, it does require that, that confidence in the face of, of, of the, the nerves and the critique of, of the audience and, and all that. Um, but in a more micro way, you're always telling a story with a poker hand and your execution and finesse and credibility often determine whether you win the hand or not. Mm -hmm. So having, having that sort of empathy and psychological skill and, and like artistic sensibility to what I'm doing, I think uh, does really help me sell the story so to speak. It's funny when you see a bunch of poker players around the table, they're all ostensibly playing the same game, but a person's background and interests really do influence the way they play it. So it's always interesting yeah. to hear that. Yeah, sort of they stuff. do. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, about performing arts, you know, to an extent, you know, you said so, like when you're on TV, you're sort of performing in a way. Mm -hmm. You've appeared on a number of poker broadcasts over the years, like Poker After Dark, of course, the WSOP main event, you know, being chip leader day three, <laughs> day four. You've done numerous on and off camera interviews. Do you enjoy the spotlight? I would say yes, but I'm cognizant. I'm cognizant of the cost of that as well. When you, uh, especially in poker, when you are in the spotlight, you are afforded and afforded a level of notoriety, um, especially being, uh, an underrepresented demographic in poker, uh, you do you do have a platform. You do have an opportunity to uh, uh, share yourself with the world and 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 be given be given uh, avenues and maybe like like sponsorships and 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 interviews and and whatever that that uh, that uh, that uh, other players may not have. Mm -hmm. um, but the cost of that is is and I think a lot of uh, teachers and coaches are a little bit worried about this is exposing your mindset for people to consume and possibly take advantage of. So you have to be you have to be cognizant that when you're explaining your thought process uh, for the world to consume that you're not opening yourself up to being exploited and you have to be confident in your ability to adjust better to your opponents than they will adjust to you. So that's that's one thing. And then there's the other the other cost of uh, being sort of like giving giving some of your life and perspective to the world and, and leaving that open to be critiqued and sexualized and, and all the other stuff that, that happens on the internet. I think as a whole, it is a positive. And I think the opportunities that being in the spotlight have afforded me outweigh the negative. Wow. I've never heard an answer like that before. It's really insightful. And, uh, you know, most people like love seeing their name in lights, love being on TV. It's, uh, it's interesting to hear the flip side of that. But, you know, the person, it's like, 
it's like the person that is under the radar in a hoodie spends all of his time like running simulations and studying at home may have an advantage because nobody knows what he's thinking versus somebody that's made a lot of coaching videos and and articulated their thought processes really well uh, for consumption. So, you know, something to think about. Switching gears, because that's what we do in poker. Late last year, you decided to embark on a bit of a new journey. You've begun speaking at corporate events. Um, What poker skills that you feel you've developed over your career Mm -hmm. translate best to the corporate world? And what topics do you usually speak about in those settings? The way I sort of see it is that is that poker is an excellent model for making decisions. And that's whether it's in game, in life, uh, for a business venture, uh, maybe in interpersonal relationships, all of it. And that the biggest um, the biggest advantage that poker has really afforded me is teaching me how to think like a poker player in other aspects of my life. I, I have noticed like a lot of my students who are who are very shrewd businessmen sometimes have sometimes struggle with the logic in poker, with the decision making in poker. And and I feel like once they get that, once they sort of become better at the strategic elements of poker, the rest of their life also benefits from those uh, improved decision making elements, including their business. Mm-hmm. And I think uh, the, the, the older I've gotten and the more I've become involved in in the business world just from a practical standpoint um i see that those processes are are very much emulated in in the in the business world deciding Hmm. deciding uh what to risk when to risk how to proceed uh sales sales tactics understanding your own biases that's a huge thing Mm -hmm. um that that is very crucially addressed in poker but often ignored Mm -hmm. um in business uh using statistics and probability to inform your decisions uh in a far more intricate way. Hmm. Um, I, I think uh, I think psychological understanding and negotiation is, is also very applicable to sales. But I, I think as a whole, using all of this data to to make better decisions to, and to to give yourself a higher quality of decision when you are making the decisions mm-hmm. is is really imparted very well in mm-hmm. poker. Um, and and that's sort of like the basis. Poker is is not necessarily a game of cards. You're not you're not taking tricks, nothing's being traded. You are being given information and you are evaluating that information. And that is exactly what's happening in the business world. And the people who best utilize that information make the best products, have the best advantages, uh, get ahead of the curve, bring innovation to the world, that kind of thing. And the people that are that are waiting to to see how it's all going in the game before playing a hand themselves are often the people left behind. Is that the type of stuff you speak about in these corporate settings? So what I like to do is tailor the concepts of poker to the business at hand. So I usually have a discussion with the company and find out what sort of areas can benefit from this style of strategic thinking. Is it sales? Is it under is it modeling adversarial business behavior using maybe like exploitative versus balanced strategies? Is it is it for startups? Uh, that that have that that need to be very selective with their capital allocation and the way they 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 interpret and go after uh, potential clients, things like that. That and and each decision is is crucial to their survival. How do you make these crazy crucial survival decisions with such limited information? That's what you're doing in poker. You're using incomplete information and maybe like one hand you've seen someone play to extrapolate an entire game plan mm-hmm. and and make the best decisions possible given that limited information. So I like to I like to see what what a company could benefit from the most and then I tailor the po- the the poker concepts to to give people new tools for thinking. Hmm. And uh, and often often uh, the <laughs> the most the most relevant thing is in is in the whole chapter of tilt the, the cognitive biases, the understanding why humans are so uh, are so bad at overcoming these biases and why we're supposed to be and, and how this has informed our survival over millennia and such and, and how to remove yourself from that human element and become more analytical, more, um, more adept at, at separating the, 
the noise from the, the data you, you need to be looking at. What does that have to do with the corporate world? So in, in the corporate world, the, the using, using this as a model, you can make decisions for your business, for profit, for sales, for advertising, whatever, by removing your emotional biases from the equation. If you have a short term failure, uh, rather than reevaluate your entire product, your entire pitch, uh, you can understand that long-term results. I mean, that's a very, a very basic kind of sure, sense. The long-term sure. results uh, don't ne- aren't necessarily measured by uh, short-term uh, distribution. I think that that's the disclaimer thing. they always put on their uh, you know their stock reports when they release them every quarter, like that sort of thing. Long-term, short-term results don't necessarily indicate profitability of the company. Over yes, months. but people <laughs> tend to use that when it's to their advantage <laughs> and course. discard it when it's not. Um, and and the reverse is true. Like it's important not to get attached to good short-term results yep. and get complacent and and maybe then not not be attuned to changing market dynamics or right. opponent behavior, things like that. Um, and, and it seems it seems simple, but the the emotional biases are so ingrained in us as humans and we, we love to rationalize our successes and failures. And that can often cost us uh, ac- seeing the world accurately, seeing our business accurately, making changes accurately. Um, something that I was research, something really funny that I was researching the other day is how do you, how do you adjust to, to randomness? Because po- randomness. randomness. Mm-hmm. So in in poker, you mm-hmm. you are adjusting to randomness all the time. Whether it's uh, the the un the 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 getting unlucky and now having to navigate this tournament with 20 big blinds when you had 100 the hand before and or having a card come the the one card in the deck that that was bad for you that mm-hmm. kind of thing and how how your adjustment to that could be the difference between winning or losing and uh there's you you can you can model your edge that way in poker so if i'm given the same hand as you the same cards as you the same situation as you will i win more than you mm. will i lose more than you that kind of thing so so every it, it's not it's not the cards you get but if someone else in that same situation if, if someone else was in that same situation how would they play that's how you that's how you uh determine your edge so i was looking at just examples in in uh in in business uh kind of infamous examples in business of of very unlikely random events happening and how the business has responded and i was learning about a company uh in the 70s that was extremely successful they were actually near the uh height of their uh of their market capitalization in maybe like 1975. Um, and it was a diet candy with the name of AIDS, A-Y-D-S. Oh, oh. And they were extremely successful. There was actually no real scientific basis uh, from, from what I was reading on for their claims. They had they had very good advertising campaigns. They had celebrities marketing their their product. They they were very very good at that that whole aspect of it. And um, it was it was meant to be uh, an appetite suppressant. The candy. I think their primary ingredient was benzocaine, which was supposed to numb the taste buds uh-huh. and therefore I guess cause you to crave food less. I don't think it actually ever worked. Okay. But they were very very good at pitching their product, and they had uh, hmm. they. Uh, they were doing very, very well. And then, of course, the epidemic AIDS became very, very prominent and, and at, at crazy highs of, of world attention. And they did not respond by changing their name. And so this is, you know, how, how many companies could, could you say like, okay, imagine that, that a crazy epidemic breaks out that has the same name as your company, how would you respond? Right. That's like something people don't think about. That's not something you, you set out to, you to have, it. exactly, sure. to have a game plan when you, when you uh, develop a company. But I think that, that they're, they, they, so they failed to respond. Um, they decided that their brand awareness was more important than distancing, them, distancing themselves from their from this particular epidemic, but they actually failed to see that their market share at this point in time was being determined by um, uh, getting new people to use their product rather than having their existing users who already knew what their brand name was and would have right. done it w- whether whether they had a change or not um, was so reliant on on accessing new mm-hmm. new customers, and so. Eventually, after their sales declined more than 50%, uh, they decided to change the name to Diet AIDS. Uh, (laughs) And they were eventually uh, 
liquidated and, and their, sure. their assets were sold to, I forget what, what the corporation was. But I find myself thinking how much of this was determined by their lack of proper response and not only maybe the lack of proper response, but the efficiency with which they executed their response. Mm, interesting. And uh, so I think about, I think I, I'm, I'm looking at stuff like this through the poker lens, how quickly adaptation is necessary, whether that makes, whether that defines whether you win or lose the tournament, sure. uh, how, how attached you get to the results you've already been having that then blinds you from attacking something with a new strategy. Right. And just, just a funny little little thing that I was researching in, sure. uh, in, in this work. Well, th and yeah. um, thank and you for I sharing think, it with us. Yeah, it. and I think when people look at it, like they, they distance themselves maybe from their business endeavors and, and the terminology they're using, and they look at it from a game perspective. And, and I say like, this is the hand I was dealt, this was the situation, this is how long it took me to recover, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And when you look at it that way and you see how how you can quantify it using different metrics and, and, uh, and terms and strategic elements, it then becomes clear from from the other side. Right. And right. Uh, and I find that in poker that has happened for me too. Like I've looked at at, at different different game strategies. I've looked at uh, something that was. I think I learned the most in my poker career after watching a six max limit cash game where the guy lost. He had a losing session. I have never played limit hold'em in my life. At that time, I had never played a cash game. And my tournament no limit poker game was most improved from watching this guy Go have figure. a losing session at a different game that I had never played. Wow. And that always kind of stuck with me. And I think using using something different like this and looking at the strategic elements of how that game is played can be very illuminating for a variety of aspects in sure. business. You made you mentioned that um, you used to be a waitress. I, I was, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I have some hilarious stories, actually. Um, well, it is quite the transition to make from poker rooms to boardrooms. And to the best of my <laughs> knowledge and my research, you haven't really had any corporate experience as an employee. It's been limited to it's just been waitressing. There yeah. you go. So a lot of a lot of it is is talking to students of mine who have been in the business world for a long time, mm -hmm. uh, contemporaries of mine who have left poker to be in the business world. Okay. Uh, my own research that I that I've been doing on on spectacular fails and successes of the corporate world and okay. how people interpret that data and stuff. So it is. It, on one hand, I come at it from a completely different life and lifestyle and and experience and and. Uh, on on the other hand, it is a, it is a brand new, fresh perspective. Is there anything that you that believe you've gained? from having been exposed to the corporate world in the last few months? Anything, any interesting insights you've taken away from sitting in all those boardrooms? <laughs> I think actually the thing that has affected me the most is the reliability of the people that I've been communicating with. In poker, uh, it is, it, no, I'm serious. In poker, it is, it is people email you back when they feel like it. Maybe not at all. Uh, maybe they for forgot. For the record, <laughs> Melanie showed up on time for this interview. <laughs> But, but when you get it, you, you have a lifestyle where you do whatever you want all the time. You waltz into a tournament, whatever you want. You you make your own schedule. You Late wedge life. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And I have been I have been very impressed by the way the way people have handled meeting me, communicating with me, hosting me, um, following up like everybody does everything they say they're going to do. And it is a very refreshing um, slice of of humanity to, to interact with. Good answer, so. good answer. Um, you've accomplished a lot uh, over your career in poker, but it could be said that you don't yet have that signature win. It could be said, yes. I imagine, <laughs> I imagine you, like all of us, cover, covet a World Series of Poker bracelet. But besides the main event, what event for you would be the sweetest one to win? And maybe are there any other specific titles or other tours that you'd love to win an event at? Yes. So the, the bracelet that I think I personally would have loved to have the most would have been the uh, heads up event in the WSOP. The 10K? Yeah. I don't really play very much heads up anymore. Um, the the landscape has sort of changed with regards to online and, and the games. The games don't really run 
the way that they used to. Mm-hmm. Uh, and since I don't play that much anymore, I don't necessarily consider myself as much of a contender in that particular bracelet event as I may as I may have in the past when I was playing it regularly. But that would have always meant the most to me because there's something very pure and special about that one versus one mm-hmm. um, sure. format. Uh, and, and, and when I was traveling the EPT, I played a lot of those events and I, I came really close once, uh, but that, that would have been very special to me. Um, the EPT in Prague is also very special to me because it was my first real major live event that I ever played. Hmm. And it was also the EPT that I came the closest to, to doing it. And I bubbled the final table in 20... Don't remember. Okay. 2010, 2012, I don't remember. And I made another deep run at another time. And so that would have been very special to me. I studied abroad there. I just have like a, a real affinity for the city. Sure. So those those are the places that I think that are the most special to me. Um, a WSOP bracelet is interestingly still the most, I think considered to be the most prestigious uh, accolade, uh, despite the fields being so big and the structures not necessarily being the uh, most skill favoring. Um, not if you play the 50k players championship maybe maybe not yeah uh i I need to learn a few other games first just saying i just got to point that out you know but i think what i've learned 100 player field i think what i've learned uh being a being a player all these years is that i uh don't have to rely on one crazy victory to validate my accomplishments in poker um or or make me feel like i'm a strong player uh, and that's that's a that's a tough lesson to have learned because I was you know traveling these tours and I was watching every friend of mine win a title and and it felt like for me I was always just like like I, I was putting myself in the same positions to win and something like horribly unlucky would happen or something would go wrong and and each time like I was sure like it wasn't going to happen this time and then it did happen this time like once again and that was very very tough to deal with emotionally. Oh. Um, to, to sort of watch everyone around you having what you what you wanted. And I just realized that I think over time that I couldn't derive satisfaction from in, in the game for something that that volatility wise was unlikely to happen. It's unlikely for anyone to win a tournament when they enter and uh, and sort of going in. You, you do have to go in with a winner's expectation and a positive mindset and all this stuff. But you also have to be happy having laid it out all on the table, having played the best, having done everything you could. And the results are the results. Yep. And that's that. So if I if I do have a major tournament victory someday, like if I win a bracelet or whatever, that will be wonderful. But it will it will not have changed the player that I am. So that is that is an important thing for me. I've got to say, that's not a cop-out. And I know on the media side of things, we love putting articles together of, uh, you know, best player, you know, without a bracelet or things like that. And yeah, it draws clicks and, you know, people all like, who, who hasn't won a bracelet yet? Patrick Antonio doesn't have a bracelet. It's crazy, right? Does he not have a bracelet? He does not yet have a bracelet. Wow. <laughs> but, um, at least to the best of my knowledge, but that is a very forthright and humble answer because yeah variants will strike and just because it, you don't have the title there's plenty of great cash game players who aren't necessarily known for their tournament or bracelet success so um you know a very humble and uh, and, and good answer and yeah it should, it's not necessarily how a poker player should judge their own self-worth based on one particular performance of one particular event yeah and i think i've i've been a lot happier since sort of sort of uh taking the pressure off myself in that way because because when you play tournaments with that in mind then you're always miserable when it doesn't happen and you when do not seem like a miserable exactly person whatsoever so. very very yeah. upbeat all the time uh the smile is genuine not just what you see on tv um well melanie i know you've got uh, tonight's charity poker tournament to prepare for so i just want to thank you very much for taking the time to sit with me here today in tel aviv before i let you go is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners um <laughs> not anything that I can think of uh, offhand. Uh, I guess people can follow me uh, if they would like to on social media. My Twitter is at Melanie Wisner. Same uh, with my Instagram. And uh, they can uh, always message me for coaching uh, via my Twitter. And I'm always happy to, to talk poker, uh, take questions, strategy questions, life questions, uh, yeah. Awesome. I don't know. Anything else? Oh, no, that sounds pretty good to me. And, you know, as much fun as this interview was to prepare for, it's uh, 
just as awesome to sit here with you and to hear your answers. Uh, really insightful. And I know this is one that I'm going to be listening to as well once we publish it. So Melanie Weisner, thank you again very, very much for sitting with me. Folks, I'm your host, Robbie Straczynski, and you've been listening to the Red Chip Poker Podcast. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode. But don't stop learning now. Head over to redchippoker.com. You'll find everything you need to get better today. Join our free, friendly strategy group and to start talking poker with our coaches and community. And listen, if you're ready to take poker more seriously, sign up for Core, our $5 a week complete training platform built for players who have limited time to study. Core is packed with over 100 bite-sized lessons from the fundamentals to advanced strategies, quizzes, achievements, discussion threads, and more. And for the bravest of heart, we invite you to check out our pro membership, which includes 24 seven access to hundreds of videos, all of our playlists, all of our crash courses, and more. If you wanna see what the top 1% of players are studying to keep their edges razor sharp, visit redchippoker.com slash Ruby. That's R-U-B-Y. And get a special deal on your first three weeks. Until next time, run good, play better, and get there.